So yeah, I'm Lucy Janes. Um, I'm from the Arlington Bass Club. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here to talk about our archive and how we've been using it. But I guess I should say that yeah, we're a, we are a sort of community group. Um, we're not professionals. Um, uh, I'm not a professional archivist. So, um, um, so this will be about how our um, our group at the Arlington Bass has been has been using our archive materials. So um, a little bit about the context. I know not all of you will be familiar with Glasgow or um, indeed with the Arlington Bass. Um, so. Um, the Arlington Bass Club was set up in 1870 by a group of men um, who organised the construction of a swimming pool. Um, it was a private members club for which you pay an annual subscription and it was run by a board of management um, uh, made up of the members. And basically that's how it still works. Um, we are Europe's oldest existing member-owned and member-run swimming pool. So in this talk I'll be focusing on the place of the Arlington Bass in the history of the city of Glasgow. Um, how we're exploring that history, the challenges that we're having with that, um, and how we hope that the history can sort of help us continue to flourish. Um, so to give you a wee bit of context, um, so this is a map of Glasgow today. Um, you can see the pin down at the bottom, which is uh, where we are just at the moment in the Central Hotel, um, and the pin further up um, across the motorway, that's the Arlington Bass. Um, uh, we're in an area called Woodlands. Um, it's part of the West End, which is just sort of outside the city centre. Um, there's a wee bit of the um, area in more detail. Um, you can see there's a, the big park, Kelvin Grove Park. Um, there's the University of Glasgow just above it. Um, there's the Botanic Gardens. And you can see Great Western Road and Byers Road. They're sort of important roads um, in the area. So you can get an idea of the sort of facilities in the area. Um, so this is um, how the area was in 1860. This is 10 years before the bath was built. Um, uh, Great Western Road um, is going across the, the, the map there. Um, but you can see that the, the area is not very developed. Um, there are some buildings, but there's also big spaces in between. Um, so the park is there, but the university is not there yet. Um, and then looking um, about 35 years later, in 1896, um, you can see immediately it's much more built up. Um, uh, Kelvin Grove Park, which was then called West End Park, um, was laid out in the 1850s. Um, important, another important date for us was the 1859, the Loch Coutrine Reservoir, um, an aqueduct was constructed outside the city, which meant that there was a clean water supply for Glasgow. Um, there's a fountain in the park that commemorates um, that achievement. Um, and of course, clean water was like absolutely crucial for the development of the baths. Um, so this is a close-up of that area, um, and the baths are marked on that, though um, you probably can't see, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, um, but um, uh, you can see it's an area of the city that was ingoing, undergoing expansion and development um, when the, pa the baths were built in 1870. Um, so it's an area with like, leisure facilities for um, the middle class, basically. Um, so a wee bit about the, how the bath looks. This is it in the early 20th century. When it first opened, it was just a swimming pool and a reading room, smoking room. Um, so this picture was taken after the fourth and final um, extension to the building in 1903. It wasn't the first baths in Glasgow, but there weren't any sort of real swimming pools, um, and there weren't any public pools until, I think, 1878. Um, so this is how the bath looks today, and this is from the other end of Arlington Street. Um, this is the pool, or the pond, as it's traditionally called. Um, and that's it today. We can see we've still got the trapezes and the travelling rings across the pond. Um, this is the card room upstairs. Um, it's now the reading room, or that's what we, we call it, the reading room. We use it for exercise classes and for exhibitions. There's the billiards room, um, and that's now the gym. Um, and this is the Turkish bath, which was added um, in 1876, so not long after the baths opened. So we're still going 150 years later, almost 150 years, um, but in recent years, it became obvious we didn't know that much about the history of the bass. So we started the Arlington Bass Club History Group. Um, we're a loose collective of volunteers. Um, some of us do have experience with archives, but certainly not all of us. We're just kind of interested in history. Um, so we started to investigate and to share uh, what we discover. So people tend to pursue the topics that interest them the most, which I think, I guess, is one of the challenges of being a community group. Um, it's hard for people to find the time. They've got work, they've got families, uh, they've got swimming. Um, uh, but it's also getting people to focus on, on a big project when they've all got their own kind of like personal things um, they want to pursue as well. So um, we use some online tools to try and share our materials. Um, we use Dropbox for notes, we use Flickr for images, and the Internet Archive um, for audio and video. Um, and this is um, our blog, um, uh, where we publish information when we're ready to sort of share it with the wider world. So where do we find the information? Um, so this is where we turn to the archive materials, um, most of which, the vast majority of which, are in the Glasgow City archives in the Mitchell Library. Um, the archive contains a wide variety of items, including, you can see here, annual reports and accounts. Um, there's competitions and gala programs. There's newspaper stories. 
Um, and there's membership lists. The backbone of the archive really is the membership books. Um, it's not a fully comprehensive set all the way from 1870, but they do contain thousands of names of Glasgow residents who were members over the years. Um, we're really fortunate to have it all preserved there. Um, and I think um, as we've started to investigate um, and look at these materials, I think we've started to develop um, quite a good relationship with the city archivists, um, some of whom are here today. <laughs> so, um, um, and uh, we also have you know, other items, like we've got some old photos. This is the earliest photo that we have of members of the club. Um, it's captioned early morning swimmers at the Arlington Baths. Um, there were 500 members originally. Um, they were all men. So we don't know exactly who the men in this photo um, are. But we have had, from looking at the, uh, the proposal books and membership lists, we can get a little bit more information. Um, so, for example, we've done a wee bit of work to try and digitise some of the information that's um, in the membership data. So we've extracted information from one of some of the earliest proposal books. This is a sample. Um, the kind of information that's collected in there, um, you can see it's names, it's occupations, it's the business addresses, it's the home addresses, it's the dates that the people applied to join, um, and it's the names of the people who proposed and seconded into them as well. So um, it's not just the people themselves, it's also the connections between them and the social networks between them. Um, once um, it's pulled out into this kind of format, obviously it's a bit easier to, to um, analyse as well. Um, so we've done things like trying to analyse the, uh, the categorise the occupations of people. Um, so in these early books, um, you can see that there are people like sort of manufacturers and shipbuilders, obviously important in the industrial city of Glasgow. Um, but there's also a large proportion of members are clerks, so not necessarily the sort of rich businessmen you might expect. Um, though I guess quite a few of those clerks could be the sons of rich businessmen, just kind of starting out in, in their careers. Um, so the proposal books are an amazing resource um, um, about the people in the city. Um, and it's quite easy to identify some members who are notable Glaswegians. Um, for example, um, this is George Henry. He was one of the Glasgow boys. Um, some of his paintings, I think you can see in Kelvin Grove Museum. Um, so uh, he, his, his membership um, application from 1899. Um, we've got um, Sir Malcolm Campbell, which if you're from Glasgow, probably means more <laughs> to you. He ran a, an empire of um, greengrocers, um, uh, which uh, continued for, for, for many years in the city. Um, uh, and I believe he's credited with also introducing bananas to Scotland, so quite an important <laughs> personage. Um, um, so uh, George Beetson, Sir George Beetson, I should say, um, who, um, this is, his, his name is on that list, number 89. Um, uh, he was a doctor and cancer specialist. Um, again, you're well known still in Glasgow. There's an oncology unit at the, the Southern General Hospital still named after him. Um, this is uh, Hugh Baird, Jr. Um, Hugh Baird is the company that supplies malt to the Scotch whiskey industry. We've got Rio Stakis, um, who owned and ran an empire of restaurants and casinos and hotels. Um, in the city and elsewhere in the UK. Um, I don't know, this is his application. I'm not sure if Rio Stakis actually ever joined, um, but certainly he did apply. Um, We've got John Letters, who's famous in golf world, that name, um, manufacturer of golf clubs and other golf equipment. Um, so these are just a few of our sort of well-known early members, very much obviously within the establishment and the kind of business class of, of Glasgow. Um, and you'll have spotted as well that they are all men. Um, we did have women members. Um, in 1872, just one year after the baths opened, the women, women were admitted. Female members had to be related to or staying in the household of a male member of the baths. So there were 36 um, founding members of the ladies' section. Um, the members of the first committee are listed here. Um, and there's some names there which are the names of the founders of the baths as well, things like uh, people like Sloan and Dalgleish and Allen. Um, they had much more restricted hours than the men. They had use of the baths on Thursdays between 11 and 2. Um, and they paid 20 shillings annual fee, which also included swimming lessons because a lot of women would not have had the opportunity to learn to swim. Um, it, uh, the, the, uh, they got the same hours on Mondays as well the following year, and the membership grew, so it was obviously it was expanding. Um, and you, I don't know if you can see it, but in the, the, um, the bit here, which is about the first committee meeting, um, it says, after a vote of thanks to the chairman, the gentlemen left, and some of the ladies enrolled themselves and had their first bath, i.e. swim. Um, which I just think is really lovely. You can imagine a kind of sense of excitement as they like take their first uh, they take their first swim. Um, but it is much harder to gain a sort of sense of their experience and who they were. Um, the ladies' minute book is mostly fairly routine kind of stuff. Um, we have found that in 1875 they held the first gala. The gala had six events. Um, this is a press report about it, possibly written by one of the ladies. Um, uh, six events, um, and there were prizes for graceful swimming. Um, it was stated that little importance will be attached to speed. 
Um, so, though obviously this did not satisfy all the ladies because in the following year there were actually three events that were introduced for fast swimming. So you can see some of them rebelled against this and decided they wanted to they wanted races just like the men had. Um, there's a mention, actually, again, in this press report about the locker between water um, and that the pond um, is emptied twice a week. Um, in the Glasgow public baths, um, the pools were drained and refilled once a week, I think, um, and I believe that the entrance fee kind of dropped um, towards the end of the week as the water became dirtier and dirtier. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the fact that it was drained and refilled twice a week is a big selling point. So... Um, some of the later membership books for the ladies do offer a bit more information. They filled out forms to join, uh, like the men had. Um, that form didn't actually ask for their occupations, but occasionally they fill out the wrong one. Um, so we do get the information. So this is Belle Jameson, um, who in October 1919 applies to join. She was a tracer at the North British Diesel Engine Works in White Inch in Glasgow. Um, and then this is Ruth Penny. She's also a tracer at the same engine works. Um, and they joined on the same day. Um, so you get a sense that there was some kind of like work friendship which then you know, was expanded outside, continued outside the workplace. Um, another interesting aspect of the membership books is that children were also members. Um, so whole families participated in the, in the life of the bath, so they would swim at different times. Um, so this is the application for Isabella Penny. Um, she was a schoolgirl at Darwin Hill Primary School. She's got the same surname um, and has the same address as Ruth Penny that we just saw. Um, and she applies to join on the same day, so I'm assuming that it's probably um, Ruth's little sister. Um, the, this one is a schoolboy at Glasgow Academy. He's aged 13. He's called Matthew Gentles. And his application is proposed by his older brothers, um, Thomas and William, who are obviously members of the Baths as well. Um, and these are the Rennie brothers. There's um, four of them in 1915. Malcolm and James, 15. Ian, 14. And Wee Douglas, who's nine. Um, but with so many thousands of names, it is a bit hard to know where to start. Um, so this year, like so many other kind of archives and museums and groups, we've um, focused on um, the First World War. We have a war memorial in the bath. Um, it has 72 names on it. Um, and in the membership books, there are also names of other people, about 200 other men who served in the war as well. Um, but this has proved to be a really rich seam of stories. Um, because of the bath being a family institution, the stories we're starting to uncover are not just of the men who died, um, but also of their sort of their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, and their wives. Um, and we're starting to document the stories on our blog. Um, for example, um, Ernest Perry. Um, so Ernest joined the bath in April 1901. This is his application form when he was an 11-year-old schoolboy. Um, he became an adult member in 1912. He trained as an engineer with um, uh, the firm Ali and McClellan, um, which is based at the Sentinel Works in Paul Medee, if anyone knows that in Glasgow. Um, and he attended courses at Glasgow University. Um, but in researching his life, we then found out that his father, Robert Perry, um, who was also a member of the Baths, um, was a distinguished physician who had written books about um, uh, disease and epidemics in Glasgow. His mother was called May Perry, um, and she was actually the first woman to become the honorary secretary of the ladies' section in 1890. And also his sisters, Hilda and Ethel, they were members too. Um, they're both mentioned in reports of the ladies' galas in the 1880s. So just a few year, um, weeks after the war was declared, Ernest joined up. He's here in his um, Highland, Cameron Highlanders uniform at the age of 25. Um, and then just a year after joining up, he was killed at the Battle of Luz in September 1915. Um, you can see his name here is scored out in the membership books and killed is written next to it. Um, and that's what they did. You, you can go through these books and you can see all the names scored out and killed, killed in action, written next to them. Um, you can also just see, actually, at the bottom of this page, um, there's a, the name Max Pollock. Um, he's still alive at this point, but he is, he's on the War Memorial as well. Um, so, but then in the Ladies' Minute book, we discovered that the Ladies' Committee had recommended that um, Ernest's sister, Ethel, be added to the club's Roll of Honour in recognition for her war work. Um, so we did a bit more research, um, and we found that Ethel had, who was 38 in 1914, she had volunteered for war duty. She went to Serbia with the Scottish Women's Hospitals, which was an offshoot of the Scot uh, Women's Suffrage Societies. Um, she later joins the Voluntary Aid Detachment, and she continued with voluntary hospital work throughout the, the First World War. And these are the medals that she received. Um, she continued um, as a member of the Baths after the war, as did her sister Hilda. Um, Hilda had actually got married in 1904, and then she moved to Ireland. But on her husband's death, she moved back to Glasgow with her young daughter, who was called Hilda. Um, and then in 1919, when she was nine years old, um, little Hilda also became a member of the Baths, um, and she was proposed by her aunt Ethel to become a member. And there's more about um, uh, the Perrys on our blog, but I suppose the point is that we started with the name of the man, a man who died in the war, and we ended up with the story of an entire Glasgow family. Um, 
There's a few other things. Uh, there's lots more stories that we're looking into. Um, here's uh, snippets of a few more. Um, this is a gravestone of Matilda Ansell. Um, her son, Captain Sidney Ansell, is recorded on this gravestone, but it's actually buried in Baghdad, um, where he died of malaria in 1920. Um, the family were members of the Jewish community in Glasgow. Sidney's father was called Pinto Ansel. Um, he was a Russian subject born in Warsaw. Um, and so Pinto and the rest of the family became naturalised British subjects in 1905 when Sidney was 12. Pinto was in the clothing trade, but Matilda also had a business. She had a ladies' outfitters on Socky Hall Street um, from about 1898 to 1911. Um, so these kinds of stories allow us to delve a little bit more into the kind of diversity of, of Glasgow um, at the time. Um, there's things like uh, Matthew Gentles, who was proposal form we saw earlier, signed by his older brothers. Um, this is his older brother, Thomas, um, Thomas Gentles. He was well known in Scotland um, as a uh, water polo player, uh, because the Arlington Baths, actually, the first bath master um, is credited with devising the rules of water polo, so it was quite an important thing at the club. Um, anyway, Matthew and Thomas both went off to war. Uh, Matthew returned. Thomas did too, but he died. Um, he was medically discharged in 1916 and died not long after of TB, which presumably was aggravated by his war service. So these are a few of the stories that we're starting to uncover. There are more that are, you know, even more hidden. Um, it's things like the other people who are closely involved with the bass are the staff. But we don't know very much about them at all. Um, you can catch some tiny glimpses. Um, these are this is a photo of the staff members um, on the doorstep of the bass in the early 20th century. Um, it's possible that one of these is a woman called Sarah Johnston, um, who provided massages for the ladies. That was a massage was included in your, your, your membership. Um, so we know from the ladies' minute book that she emigrated to Canada in 1907, and the ladies had a, a collection to give her a small sum of money um, in recognition for her services. But it's just these kind of tiny glimpses that you catch, um, and we're hoping in some ways to, to try and find out more. So all of this history is interesting, I hope. Um, but for the Bath as an organisation, um, there is a wider sort of strategic purpose. We're hoping that the stories of the past members help bring the, the, Bath, the history of the Bath to life for current members, make them feel they're part of a sort of special community. It has sparked some current members to, um, to share some memories and some mementos. Um, one person handed in this um, photo of her mother, uh, grandmother, sorry, Phil Ferguson. Um, and she's in her Arlington swimming costume. We had regulation costumes. You can just see there's a little white A on her tummy, um, which is what all the costumes had. They had an A on them. Um, um, and the other uh, photo is Ken Deacon, taking part in the um, 1951 annual swimming competition. Um, and just behind him, actually, is a member of staff. That's the bass master at the time, who was called Bob Sadler. Um, again, someone we want to find out more about. Um, so some families, you can see, have been members for several generations. Um, uh, but we are situated in a part of the city which um, now has a significant Scottish-Asian population. Um, our membership does not reflect the diversity um, of the local community. Um, some of that is to do with the fact that we are, the vast are more expensive than joining an ordinary gym or using the, um, uh, the Glasgow Life facilities, which are excellent. Um, but we're keen to foster links with our local community, and we're wondering if the history can help with that. Um, so the, the families may not have been in the local area, may not have been in Glasgow as long as the, some of our long-standing generational members. Um, but the homes they live in and the streets they know um, have been there that long. Um, we have an aspiration to maybe try and develop a project with schools that would encourage local children to learn more about the history of the area through researching the lives of the children who were members. Um, um, children who possibly live in the same street or just around the corner from, from where they are now. So the idea is to work with schools to help identify individual children from the uh, proposal books, for the children to research, allow them to develop some research skills, understand the importance of checking facts, um, and also that not everything is on the internet. Um, thought it might be instructive for the pupils to take um, a boy and a girl's name um, and to research those, and then thus through the process perhaps sort of see why some of the stories of women are more easily forgotten. Um, they don't feature so much in the official records. Um, we'd be keen to publish stories they uncover on the website so they can see how it's important to reference sources and that um, uh, readers can be confident that the, the facts are accurate. Um, and their research would sort of be contributing to the story of the local area, um, revealing that their place, Woodlands, um, has been home to all sorts of people who have had interesting lives um, and perhaps help to support their connection, people's connection with that place um, and have a sen sense of pride in the, the local area. Okay, but creating that project is quite a lot of work, so at the moment, sadly, it is still an aspiration. In the meantime, we're continuing to try and share the history as much as we can. Um, 
uh, and connect with the wider community. Um, so we offer tours of the building at Doors Open Day. In fact, you, well, you can go for a tour anytime, really, but Doors Open Day. Um, we're holding more public events at the Bass, and the history gives us um, uh, a focus for that. So this is one of our events from last year, um, actually, which was in partnership with Glasgow Women's Library. <laughs> um, um, uh, on the history of women swimmers, which was very relevant, obviously, as we've had women for members for so long. Um, so we're trying to continue to share our stories um, at events like this, find new inspiration as well at events like this, um, and publish the, the stories online. Um, and you can keep up to date and follow some of those stories um, and how they sort of fit into the bigger narrative of the city of Glasgow um, uh, at the blog and on Twitter um, and on Facebook. Thank you very much.